Hello and welcome. We're meeting today in the context of a pandemic that has put nearly half of the world's 3.3 billion workforce at risk of losing their livelihoods. And the pandemic, as we've just heard, has shone a spotlight on the stark inequalities between jobs, between regions, between black and white, men and women, and between generations. It's shown us that those who do the most important work earn the least. And when we've most needed care, for example, we've all seen that our existing settlements are threadbare. The truth is that these challenges are not new. Before the pandemic, everything was not fine, but the challenges have become glaring. We can see their root causes in a series of social and economic imbalances that are rooted in a way of life that exceeds our ecological limits. And these are the challenges at the heart of the Great Reset. We've been here before. In the post-war era, new forms of social infrastructure from the United Nations to European welfare states were a response to the deep disruption of war and the profound social and economic inequalities that preceded it. In the 20th century, war and public outrage at inequality led to a social revolution in the form of a new social settlement. So the question is, what should we design now? How can we make a transition to a more equitable future where good work is the norm? How can we address the legacy challenges, which mean that even in the good times, millions live lives of deep stress and precarity? What does a 21st century settlement look like? And what is the role of business, the state and social movements in bringing it into being? I'm Hilary Cotton. I'm a social entrepreneur, a young global leader, and I work on the redesign of welfare systems. And this morning, I'm just delighted to be joined by such an esteemed panel. His Excellency Paul Kagame, the President of Rwanda. His Excellency Pedro Sanchez, the Prime Minister of Spain. James Quincy, CEO of the Coca-Cola Company. Joanne Jenkins, CEO of AARP. Sharon Burrow, General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation. And I'm also delighted that we've got Sadia Zahidi from the forum with us and she'll make some closing remarks. So our time is very short to try to dig into some of these complex questions, but uh, Prime Minister Sanchez, perhaps I can start with you. In many countries, the pandemic has revealed these inequalities, some of them deep rooted as in the case of structural youth unemployment. So can you tell me briefly about some of the measures that Spain has taken in response? Okay, thank you. Good morning uh, to everyone. Um, I would say that COVID-19 has prompted uh, a massive policy uh, response uh, with large similarities in the instruments, uh, use and objectives uh, pursued by most governments. We have changed the paradigm. Uh, from the start of the pandemic, the Spanish government set out uh, uh, what we call a social and economic shield to protect families, uh, workers and companies. And let me highlight four of these measures. Uh, Short-time work and furlough schemes, um, a tool that we want to turn into a, a permanent fixture uh, in our toolbox. At the aid of the first wave in the pandemic, of the pandemic, uh, 3.6 million workers were covered by these schemes. At the end of uh, 2020, uh, this number was down to more or less uh, 750,000, uh, a 79% reduction since April. More than 750,000 uh, uh, young workers under 20 uh, have benefited uh, from this. The second is a minimum living uh, income, a permanent measure that will support more than uh, 850,000 vulnerable families to tackle structural inequality. The third, a law on teleworking to provide uh, flexibility to both companies and workers. And finally, bank warranty facilities of over um, um, 87 billion euros. This has allowed companies to receive uh, 115 billion euros in financing, supporting more than more or less uh, 600,000 companies, mostly SMEs and self-employed. And now my country, uh, as you know, is one of the main recipients of the Recovery and Resilient Plan um, uh, in the framework of the European Union, with an allocation of nearly uh, 70 billion euros in transfers uh, for the period 21-26. Three aspects need to be emphasized of our plan. The first, investments that will create jobs and transform our economy. 
Second, enact long-lasting reforms that will rise productivity and also competitiveness. And finally, upskillings and reskillings uh, of workers into sectors with high demand, mainly ecological transition and, and digitalization. In my view, this is key. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Prime Minister. I mean, I'm very interested that you talk about the transition into the kind of green jobs and what that might entail. I mean, do you think just very briefly that that, I mean, that really does require the design of a new social contract? Because previously we've just thought about people falling out of work rather than this fundamental transition we've got to make, often for people who are in very good work but need to switch jobs if we are going to have a green new deal. Can you say a little bit about what specifically Spain is doing on that front? Oh, absolutely. I, I, at the European level, as you know, we have agreed um, some weeks ago to a further 55% reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. Uh, the Spanish government is second to none in the ambition to progress towards a de decarbonized economy. Early last year, we formally approved the state uh, of climate emergency, and we will soon approve in the parliament, the national parliament, a major law on climate change. By 2013, 74% of the electricity will be generated through renewable energy in coherence with the, a trajectory towards a 100% renewable electricity sector in 2050. In the next three years, we will invest 1.5 billion euros in the development of green hydrogen projects and about 1 billion in the circular economy. It's a key uh, lever of industrial modernization in, in the Spanish economy. And we will also um, channel resources for the recovery and resilience plan to renovate uh, 500,000 homes and buildings and enhance their energy efficiency. So we're very committed with these transitions. Uh, we, we want to also to integrate the social perspective and also the territorial perspective in the ecological, ecological transition. And therefore, we, we found a huge opportunity to create uh, jobs, new jobs uh, in new sectors. And of course, we have the, the challenge of the employability, especially uh, for the youth. Yes, well, I hope we might come back to that because structural youth unemployment is, of course, not just a problem that Spain is facing. But President Kagami, if I can turn to you, I mean, when we think historically about the 20th century social settlement, I mean, the one thing that's very clear is that it worked very well for largely male white workers in the global north, but often at the expense of the global south. And I think when we think about designing a new social contract, it's absolutely critical that this social contract doesn't trade one part of the globe off against another. And this is something I know you've thought about. So could you share some thoughts about what need to be the principles that make this truly a global settlement this time around? World Economic Forum for arranging this important discussion and uh, happy to be with you, Prime Minister Sanchez and uh, the distinguished leaders from uh, business and civil society. Well, first of all, I think in the situation we are today of the pandemic, uh, we have been learning lessons or things we learned in the past but never really came uh, to apply. And uh, the pandemic, as we have seen, has hit workers very hard. And uh, governments have responded with the tools available. In Rwanda, for example, we have established the Economic Recovery Fund of uh, around 100 million designed to help uh, companies stay afloat. We also use the agriculture reserve to supply food to vulnerable families during lockdown and uh, paid health insurance for 2 million citizens. This crisis has revealed gaps in the existing social protection systems everywhere in the world. So to your point, therefore, we've seen how the world has been affected. We have seen how the world has responded. And it has just brought to the surface the existing problems you have uh, known before but not tackled. In many cases, uh, these systems had already been hollowed out due to fiscal austerity and the erosion of labor protections. This, this has been a, a very key feature of the problems we, we, we are talking about. Fixing this is something that needs to be done anyway. It will also make our societies 
more resilient in the face of future pandemics because maybe there are so many around the corner. The social protection agenda cannot be limited to wealth countries indeed. We, in fact, the pandemic has also reminded us of uh, how we are interlinked and how we are interdependent in many ways so that in one part of the globe, uh, things happening will affect the other part as well. It doesn't matter how rich or how poor we are. It must be inclusive, therefore, uh, globally. Otherwise, existing inequalities among countries will only grow wider and the working conditions in developing countries will degrade. An important point is the arbitrary uh, distinction between formal and informal uh, sector employment, uh, particularly in the developing countries. Many earn their livelihood as small-scale entrepreneurs, especially women and young people. We need, therefore, innovative and comprehensive approaches to social protection that include workers of all uh, backgrounds and types. I have learned that uh, there is a suggestion for Global Social Protection Fund, uh, and this is a bold idea that merits serious consideration by policy makers. So I thank you for inviting me to share briefly what we can. Thank you very much. I mean, I think we know that some of the most innovative protection strategies have actually been, been developed on the African continent by informal workers that have kind of shown us the way the union movement might move in particular. And perhaps we can come back to that in the questions. I'd be very interested. Um, James, can I turn to you? One of the uh, aspects of the post-war social settlement that most interests me and is often overlooked, I think, is the role that progressive business leaders played. And I've developed this concept of the idea of the new industrialist to describe people who have led businesses in every previous technology revolution. And they've gone against the opinions often of their peers, sometimes of their boards, to argue for a very different settlement for workers, not because they're philanthropists, but because they think this is how capitalism can move forward. Um, so do, where do we see this progressive thinking in business today? I've heard you, for example, speak very powerfully about the legacy of racial inequality and your commitment to this in your business. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I do really think business leaders must help shape an economy that works for everyone. I mean, as you say, it is, it is part of the social contract. Uh, and one of the dimensions, uh, you know, is greater racial uh, e equity and justice within the companies and within society. Um, and if you want to take the, the simple example that typifies it in companies often is the representation at the executive level. Uh, let's look at the U.S. Uh, it's got a long way to go. I mean, it, it, it's incredibly recently, only 34 years ago, there was the first black CEO of a Fortune 500 company in the U.S., uh, the first Hispanic CEO of a Fortune 500 company was 40 years ago. That was actually Roberto Boisueda, who was one of the, my predecessors as chairman and CEO of Coke. But even today, those many decades on, uh, representation at executive levels is about 14% in the US, which is less than half uh, the representation of the population. So there's a, there's a long way to go. Um, and, and I think leaders need to do two things uh, to, to push uh, whether it's this simple example or the broader society issues. One is uh, people have got to know what your company stands for uh, and people have got to know you want to reflect the markets that you serve as a company. Uh, and, and setting the purpose is important um, because that, without a clear mission and vision on societal and sustainability issues, not just business issues, uh, without that clear mission and vision, the actions and investments won't align and won't come accordingly. Uh, we, in 2019, refreshed our uh, purpose to, to refresh the world and make a difference. And, and within, it, within it, we were very clear that we seek uh, to create a better shared future, to, to invest in improving people's lives from our employees uh, to all those who touch the business system, not just as a matter of social justice, but as a matter of uh, business imperative. So can but I... We also, sorry. Sorry. sorry, I think we also need to reflect the markets we serve. Um, and so one of, the, one of the objectives has to be uh, uh, to work with the leaders to ensure that we are representative. Creating a diverse and inclusive workforce is, is, is a critical 
social need, but it's also an important business need to foster innovation uh, and connection uh, to the community. And this, this journey is super important. Um, of course, globally, racial inequality is a complex issue, uh, but it's also an urgent issue. And, and so lasting change will only come from a long-term commitment and a strategy that is both sustainable and measurable. So thinking, I mean, uh, if you're an employee of the Coca-Cola company in the US or in India, for example, how do you think that this vision that you've set out is actually going to impact on people's lives? Klaus Schwab has been very clear in the in the Great Reset that this is about wage differentials, about new tax regimes. How do you think that this will actually play out for workers in, in your company and indeed in other companies? Look at that, the Coca-Cola company. I think it's it, it's gonna it's gonna play out uh, uh, in very specific ways, which is through the investment, uh, firstly by the company uh, in its own employees uh, with 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 training, not just training for skills, but training on diversity uh, uh, and equity in inclusion, uh, so that we can generate uh, representation of the uh, the population we serve in the U.S. throughout the organization. Uh, U.S. companies. Uh, uh, have typically been better at the entry level positions than they've been at the mid level positions, and and and, and the, the executive and the board level has been has been most challenging. Uh, we've done well at our board level, and uh, we've done reasonably well at the executive level. We need to do much better in the professional mid tier uh, level, and that's where we're investing our money. But the, the, we can't just see the limit of that uh, as our own company or as our own employees. We need to think about our ecosystem. The one great thing large companies like Coke can do uh, is they can influence the entire ecosystem around them of lots of smaller companies and help them to uh, live up uh, to the dream. And so we can do that by being clear. We set very clear uh, supplier uh, principles, policies, uh, not just uh, on, on racial equity issues, but also deep into sustainability and quality. Uh, and we can spend a lot more money uh, uh, buying uh, from minority-owned businesses. For example, we committed to doubling our, our purchases from black-owned businesses uh, in the U.S., uh, 500 million. Uh, and, and so we have to see um, our, our impact as not just our companies uh, and generating representation, well-paid representation uh, within the companies, but deeply into the ecosystem because in the end, it's the large companies that, that can be the, the engine of the train that, helps all the smaller companies move forward too. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's, I hope we can come back to that. Thank you. Um, Joanne, I'm going to turn to you. Um, at AARP, you are advocating for a particular population group that has been very hard hit in this pandemic, older workers. And in fact, the data I think is increasingly showing us that, that young people uh, are bouncing back in some places, but for older workers, the challenge is even greater. So how can we make sure that this is also a generational reset and a kind of collaborative one at that, not a sort of pitting of one generation against the other? Well, Hillary, you're correct. We know that here in the US, over 420,000 people have died and 95% of them have been over the age of 50. And so we know that COVID has hit older people in a very dramatic way. And I think that as we begin to rebuild this, uh, <clears throat> uh, our new social safety net and sort of do this reset, we have to think about creating multi-generational workforce. Uh, in many ways, uh, our work with the WEF and with OECD on the, the future of work, the pandemic has brought to the forefront immediately as we think about what uh, and, and contemplate what the five generation workforce was gonna look like 10, 15 years from now. We're now in that. We're now in that and we're seeing the importance of uh, having multi-generational employees uh, in our places of work, the value that uh, they bring by having uh, the use of technology, but also that wisdom uh, and experience in the workplace at the same time as we contemplate and conquer uh, problems that we never anticipated like COVID-19 uh, pandemic hitting us. And so we see the value of having multi-generational workforces and how, and how we can keep uh, <clears throat> them in the workplace longer. Uh, we saw with COVID the dramatic need to have uh, healthcare workers come back out of retirement to help with vaccine uh, uh, 
vaccinations and also with caring for older people. We've seen how technology has changed. You know, we used to think that we need to make sure that older people learn how to do, use technology. Uh, and they have shown in the resilience in how they've learned to use technology and continue to do their work and communicate in their families uh, using technology. And I think that's we're only at the tip of the iceberg for how we need to make sure that all of us as CEOs are integrating technology into our work and making sure that every one of our employees understand how we can use technology, not to replace uh, that personal contact, but to use it as a way to accelerate, uh, in our case, the impact that we're having on people's lives every day. We know that particularly an older person who is out of work takes longer to get back into the workplace. And so we need to make sure that uh, as companies, we're making, we're taking the extra effort to make sure that we have staff at all levels of the organization and at all age groups and all diversity. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'm interested in technology front and center, which is not usually what one expects when we're talking about sort of older generations in particular, but I think that's so important. Um, I wanted to ask you a slightly different question as well, because I think AARP is the world's largest not-for-profit organization working across very diverse sectors. And I think something that we can see that's really critical is that new forms of collaboration are going to be absolutely fundamental if we're really going to create a new social contract. Um, we need this this collaboration between stakeholders, between business, the state, civil society and social movements. And um, at the moment, often these stakeholders are very divided. This is one of the few forums really where we can all come together to discuss. So could you share with us what kind of tactics you think there are that we could use now to create a more meaningful collaboration between these often divided stakeholder groups? Well, uh, thank you, Hillary. I, you know, one of the things that we did a couple of years ago, because we were seeing the beginnings of, of this taking place at our uh, membership uh, across the country, and we know that people want to be involved and engage with other or, uh, organizations or companies that are in their community. So we took a, uh, uh, a uh, tactic to say we needed to move AARP, which represents some 38 million people over the age of 50 in the U.S. to move from being a national organization to being a nationwide organization. So we set up offices and structures across the 50 states, and now we're in over two or 300 different communities, being in the communities where people live so they can experience AARP and we can provide them valuable insights uh, and information and knowledge, which proved, I think, invaluable during this pandemic. But we've also taken the approach to, uh, of what we call the three Ps, that we have to take personal responsibility for continuing to educate and teach ourselves so that we are employable, uh, that there is a public responsibility at all levels, at state, local, national levels, uh, for the role of the uh, public sector to create uh, uh, guidelines and laws that govern uh, racial equity and uh, guard against discrimination. And then there is a role for the private sector that we have to engage the private sector to think and help us solve some of these issues that COVID has brought to the forefront in very dramatic ways about health inequalities, about, uh, you know, creating livable wages for people all across this country and indeed all across the world. And so having that, what we call the three Ps, personal, public, private, I think is going to be key to bringing together stakeholders uh, so that we can create a society, create this new social safety net uh, that helps everyone succeed, not just the 1% at the top, but that we're creating livable communities uh, and, and green communities all across this country. Thank you, Joanne. And I'm really glad that you said that people want to be engaged because I think one of the kind of fantastic stories about this pandemic is that we've actually seen this, that sometimes leaders distrust that there will be participation, but actually we've seen in communities and neighbourhoods everywhere, you know, Britain, the US, Rwanda, that people do want to, to engage. And that leads very nicely to, to you, Sharon, because you're a radical trades unionist and you have called for people power to be at the heart of a new social settlement. And you've been a beacon for many of 
us um, in that in that call. And I know you're developing a new concept of a global social protection fund, which I want to come to. But first, I want to just ask you a broader question about the union movement in this current revolution, because looking back at previous technology revolutions, we see that uh, profound changes take place in labour organising. You know, we had the guild movement in the 19th century, then industrial mass trade unions in the 20th century. Um, and I think in many places, people have been reminded in this pandemic of the purpose of labour organising. We've seen um, people join unions in quite big numbers in this pandemic. But do you really think that the current structures we have are fit for purpose? I mean, President Kagame, for example, has talked a lot about informal labour. Um, uh, Prime Minister Sanchez has talked about the need to kind of make fundamental green transitions. How do you think the labour movement itself needs to be reinvented as part of this social settlement? Well, thank you, uh, Hilary, and to the other panellists. I'm delighted to, to appear with you all. Unions already knew the crisis we faced before the pandemic hit. You know, the climate emergency, historical levels of inequality driving exclusion, anger and despair. And COVID-19, as the video was set out very well, laid that beer. So we've got choices now. Will people be at the forefront with their environment of a new social contract or will we see business as usual? So this week is very important. Let me say there are five worker demands and these come from the unions and they cross all sectors because what you don't hear about is in fact the actual breakdown of the labour market. You can't build a global economy if indeed, as President Kagame said, we've got globally more than 60% of the workforce in informal work, in despair, no rights, no minimum wage, no social protection, and they need to be included. Indeed, our unions are a broad church. We organise in traditional structures, we organise online, and we organise in the informal sector, building cooperatives, supporting uh, those uh, entrepreneurs who are, you know, owner uh, uh, entrepreneurs, and they should be covered indeed by the demand. So what are they, given the time? Jobs, climate-friendly jobs with just transition, that means all sectors must transition. So every worker should be engaged in dialogue with their employer in a tripartite uh, discussions with their governments to get a, uh, an agreement about transition to a net zero future. That's the security for the planet and for people. Rights, the floor of rights for all workers. Indeed, President Kagame laid this out in terms of the informal economy, but what President Sanchez didn't say is he's been one of the first to actually respond to the union's demands for legislation to protect workers in the explosion of telework. And the ILO Centenary Declaration laid out this floor. It's very simple. It's fundamental rights. It's uh, indeed uh, a occupational health and safety, which we want to be a fundamental right. It's uh, a minimum or adequate living wage on which workers can live with dignity and it's control over maximum hours of work. And then, of course, we want uh, social protection. And the Global Social Fund, I think you'll come back to, but Social Protection Fund, but it's vital if we're to, see, to, to really see some global solidarity and a different economic model. And then there's equality, income, race, gender, and there's inclusion. You know, when you saw how many people we had to fight for to get access to health and now access to vaccines, peace, people, a new model of development, if we don't have a more inclusive world, then we're really just perpetuating the past and it will bring a lot of conflict. There's a lot more to say, but they're the five worker demands that we want to see form the basis of a social contract. And then, of course, anything people in their communities want to see and feel trust in the future should be included by them. Thank you, Sharon. I mean, can you talk a bit more about the Global Social Protection Fund, about what's new and, and how you think that the important demands you've made will actually, you know, what traction do you have to make sure it goes beyond just a sort of right that, that sits there, but people can't actually access and, and bring into the everyday? Well, precisely, Hillary, we've had the right. In fact, the UN system over 10 years ago now, led by uh, uh, indeed... Um, you know, a, a, a UN ILO-sponsored commission actually set out 
the, the demand for universal social protection and the social protection floor. But indeed, we now have 75% of the world's people with little or no social protection. Again, President Kadami laid this out. So this is a moment of solidarity. If the spend on recovery to date, or just indeed sustaining through the crisis to date is 13 trillion or so, we could get to 20 trillion or beyond. Are we prepared uh, to take, you know, some billions of that and kickstart social protection funds? Because if you don't have a new social contract that is actually about uh, recovery, but it's also about resilience and a floor for the future, then we're not serious. So the funding gap for the poorest of countries is around 80 billion, even getting part way there to help build those social protection funds. So we support this. It'll go to the G20 leaders this year. France has been incredible in leadership. Germany, Italy, the EU, the ILO, the OECD, Argentina, we need to make sure that we are building a world where our neighbours prosper in a new development fund, in a new world development model, and that means let's underpin it with a social protection fund for the world. And let's fund that with a combination of uh, uh, debt relief. We've gone so far, but the business community through the ICC, and we support going even further. Let's get debt workout mechanisms to give developing countries a fair go. Let's add to that with the liquidity swaps from special drawing rights in solidarity, but let's fund tax uh, the, the recovery through tax, not austerity. We really have to change the model, break up global monopolies and make everybody pay their fair share. Thank you very much, Sharon. Now, I'm hoping we can come back to some of this. We've been joined um, online by a very large audience from around the world this morning who are asking us many questions. So I'd like to uh, just dip into a few of those questions now. Um, I've been asked um, specifically, President Kagami, to ask you about what, what practical things you are able to provide. I'm going to this question because it links directly to what Sharon was talking about and she's been talking about the work you've been doing. But what what real protection can you provide to informal workers and to social entrepreneurs? How can this really play out in practice? Um, we know, I mean, in, in my own country, in the UK, that, you know, it's been very difficult to reach some, some sectors of the workforce who have been left out. So could you share with us actually how you're doing this? Uh, thank you. Uh, I think the first thing you have said about... Uh, people being engaged, people feeling that they are part of what is going on and they can participate, they can benefit, is very important. And that comes from how government recognizes that fact and works with different groups, whether in the formal or informal sector. And organization is very important, so what if what we have been doing is to organize people in different sectors and the government therefore interacts with them to know what the, the government can contribute, what the people themselves can be able to put together and how they work with uh, the private sector as well, uh, availing some of the tools or resources as may be uh, required. As I mentioned to you, when we were hit by this pandemic, what we have tried to do is recognize, for example, it has involved lockdowns and so on, you know, different restrictions, but we made sure that all along we have been, for example, we have had in agricultural sector, whenever we have every harvest every year, we have put aside uh, to food to create stocks, always prepared for anything that might come in the future. So some of these people, we know some of our uh, rural areas and poor people will need to work for what to live on in terms of food. So we, because of the organization we have put in place, we are able to enable them access food and the government has made that contribution to make sure that they get food they want. And as I also mentioned earlier, we have set up uh, an economic recovery fund uh, from uh, our resources to make sure that whenever there is that opportunity, companies, uh, small enterprises 
can go back to doing what they need to do uh, to get the economy running. And this money has gone to specific areas. But again, we rely on how organized they are. And in fact, sometimes we are able to be, to identify those who need uh, whatever we give them from their own organizations. They point areas of need, they point the people who have been hit most, and therefore we follow that and make sure that everything is moving in harmony. So organization is, is key and um, representation and being mindful that everybody needs, needs to be brought into the fold and engaged. Well, I think what's very interesting about what you're saying, President Kagame, is that you've got a very localised strategy. You don't expect some centralised kind of one size fits all to work. And again, that's something we've seen, I think, in many of our nations in this pandemic about how we need to have sort of horizontal forms of organising, localised, not sort of top down, which again is a big shift from the way we might have seen this in the 20th century. Now, I'm being asked a lot of questions about young people. I'm being asked uh, when uh, we, perhaps the older leaders, think it might be time for us to step down and let younger leaders take over. I'm also being asked questions about specifically how younger people can be positioned in the labour market. And um, perhaps, Prime Minister Sanchez, I can come to you because you have talked very powerfully before about how the structural problems of youth unemployment in Spain, and after all, Spain is not the only uh, country with this problem, um, are not being solved by 20th century education uh, systems. They're not being solved um, by just providing any old job, that young people, they want meaning, they want a different role in their lives, that we have to have something fundamentally different at the heart of this new social settlement. So could you talk a little bit more about that? I mean, do you, for example, think that the experiments you've been doing with UBI are a way forward with this? How do you see this sort of socially, culturally, as well as economically? Thank you, Hilary. I think, I think that the youth unemployment is unacceptable high in Spain. Uh, less available data show that 40% uh, of workers under 25 years old uh, can find a job. So since uh, the, the present issue is at the center of my um, um, government uh, agenda, we are ready to take decisive um, um, actions at this front. Let me highlight three areas of intervention in this respect. First, education and vocational training. We have uh, just approved uh, a new educational law and we're working a new uh, law on, on vocational training, uh, which uh, I personally consider is, uh, is crucial. Second, uh, digital skills. We will spend uh, more or less 2.5 billion euros uh, in a massive plan to advance digital skills with a special focus on girls. Uh, and finally, job con contract regulation. Uh, we will review all incentives to hire young workers and will uh, reinforce uh, apprenticeship uh, contracts uh, so that they are used not as a cheap labor, but to, to ensure continual learning of, of young people. Against uh, the, the, the context of the recovery and resilience plan, uh, we will modernize uh, the design of active labor market policies with a view to enhance uh, youth employability. In, in so doing, uh, we will invest more than uh, uh, 750 million euros, especially the day dedicated to youth employment. So yes, we, 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 we consider that this is one of the major uh, challenges to, to, to work uh, in the, in the uh, short and, and medium term. Okay, thank you. I mean, just on the cultural point, I mean, James, you, you have a company that is a kind of cultural icon in that, in that sense. How do you see the positioning of this and, and you've, you know, young people in particular in your company and young workers? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. We need to do everything we can to keep the, the entry points open uh, uh, for the young uh, uh, workers. You know, ultimately, we have four generations uh, of employees uh, running through the company. Um, but, you know, we have to, uh, as a matter of investing in the future, keep uh, bringing in the young people, keep investing uh, in their training, whether they be on the professional side uh, or, or in more of the, the, the manufacturing and the distribution side. Um, so we're maintaining open all those doors uh, uh, to bring them in because, you know, the, obviously in an economic crisis, uh, and we're not through the health crisis yet, but the economic crisis is there too, uh, certainly waiting in the wings. Um, and, and I think it's the role of the large companies and influencing down into their ecosystems uh, to continue to generate 
the entry opportunities for youth. I mean, just today in the newspapers, it's saying it's going to be the hardest graduate market uh, for a decade. Um, and, and so that's, that is the role of the companies. Uh, and we have to invest uh, to see ourselves through um, and be known for a great place to work for professionals, but also, uh, back to uh, uh, Sharon's point, a great place for uh, you know, blue-collar workers who can uh, get a job that can afford a car and a house and, and, and a good standard of life. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to ask one final question. A number of people are asking cultural questions, actually. They're saying, what is the role of arts, culture, museums in a new social settlement? Which is very interesting because, of course, in the Roosevelt New Deal, art and artists were right at the heart of how we thought about society. I mean, they're also, I think, can help us reimagine things like, Joanne, the generational contract. So I don't know, I mean, can I just ask you, Joanne, just to make a kind of comment on this or, or anybody else who wants to come in? Uh, sure. Let me first say uh, for the previous question that I don't think it's an either or hiring younger workers or older workers. I right. think the uh, our research shows that <clears throat> over 6,000 global companies that uh, we reached out to, 83% of them said that they get a greater value and a return on investment when they have multi-generational uh, workforces. As, as someone who spent uh, 15 years of my career at the Library of Congress as one of the icons cultural institutions. I think it's so important that we, we use this kind of culture, uh, whether it be art or history, <clears throat> museums, libraries, uh, they play such an important role uh, in helping to define a culture, to learn from the past and also be prepared uh, to think about the future in different ways. And we can learn <clears throat> from those historical documents and pieces uh, and how important it is to have that uh, to to bring about well-rounded uh, individuals and communities as well as, uh, as employees and organizations. And, I, and so I think that there is a very vibrant role for cultural institutions as we put in place a new social safety net around the world. Okay, thank you. I mean, Sharon, I'm sure that you would like to also, we're, we're almost out of time, but I'm sure that, you know, this is a sector as well that you're helping to organize and, and, and think about rights for the cultural sector as well. Well, it's, it's critical. And when we saw who was left out of the social floor at that union actually were proud to see advances on during the pandemic, it was indeed in, in amongst the many other people, the culture, the arts, the workers who provide us with the soul, if you like, of our, uh, of our communities and indeed the entertainment that gives us all the, you know, a sense of, uh, of living. And they were totally left out. So if we need that floor of rights, a social uh, protection frame that's inclusive for everybody, it's absolutely about that. And they must be seen as real work. Part of the problem in our the way we define work is indeed it's simply divided into those that think this is work and those that don't. Yeah. And, uh, and these are real workers, but they're also the soul of okay, our community. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Um, we're almost out of time and we could, I mean, I'm so grateful to the panellists, all of you who've joined us. The questions are really big. I mean, I think we've got room for optimism. Uh, we have, as we've all been talking about, been shocked by the inequalities. People have been awakened. At the same time, we've seen that we can pivot at speed and new things can happen. Um, Sadia, I, I'd like to ask you to make some closing remarks. And Professor Schwab has encouraged us to reflect, reimagine and reset. So could you could you talk to us a bit about this in the context of the work of the social new social contract that you lead at the forum? Thank you. Thank you so much, Hillary. I think it's been a very rich conversation and we can probably glean from it five sort of takeaways of what are the new features of this new social contract. One is that to have opportunity for all, you actually do need to create customized solutions, customized solutions for women, for youth, for older workers, for people of different abilities, for people of different races, people of different ethnicities. The second key feature is that we do actually need a new approach to labor laws, to education, to reskilling, to health, to redeployment, to social protection because of this new technology driven economy that we're now a part of. Third, there is room for optimism, as you just said. Um, we actually can have a new approach to job creation in various sectors, whether that's in education, in the care economy, in technology, as long as it is compatible with the planet and with a move towards a greener economy. Fourth, um, this new social contract can be based on 
new types of incentives from governments, but also build into it the creativity and innovation and capital of the private sector, as well as the deep involvement of the communities that are actually involved, the specific groups that need greater support from this new social contract. And finally, this has to be both national and global. A lot of the implementation has to be done locally, but there is essentially a new global social protection floor that we need to be aiming for. Um, finally, thank you so much uh, to you, Hillary. Thank you to uh, the Prime Minister. Thank you to the President. Thank you, James Quincy. Thank you, Sharon Burrow. Thank you, Joanne Jenkins. And the World Economic Forum platform is available for continuing this dialogue, in particular through specific initiatives on the reskilling revolution, on the new social contract, on racial justice, and on social justice. Thank you.